Hello and welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast of Army Management Staff College. Leader Up is a professional conversation where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army civilian professional. I'm your host, David Howie. And on today's episode of Leader Up, we have an absolutely outstanding guest. And uh, our guest today is a highly distinguished and highly accomplished member of the Army's non-commissioned officer corps. And this is Command Sergeant Major Jason Porras. And he is the Sergeant Major, the Command Sergeant Major of Army University. So Command Sergeant Major Jason Porras, thank you for being with us today on Leader Up. Thank you very much for having me. It's a privilege and an honor. Thank you very much. And thank you. And I'm sure that our Leader Up audience is uh, interested to hear your thoughts about uh, Army civilians and about leadership in general. And so I want to start with just your background in the Army, what you've done, and maybe a little bit about why you came into the United States Army. Sure. Um, so first of all, I, I've been in the Army for, uh, I hit 26 years next month, uh, joined as a 42 Alpha, so Human Resources NCO. Um and I would say the reason I joined the Army, uh, to be honest with you, it's kind of my family business. Both my grandfathers are uh, retired NCOs. They both retired to Sergeant First Class, so it's, it's kind of what I know. Those are my two role models, uh, my two people I look up to more than anybody else. Um, so for me, it was a no-brainer to join the Army. Uh, some of my assignments uh, worked back and forth between both the TRADOC and the FORSCOM realm. Uh, most recently, my battalion CSM time, I was the – Special Troops Battalion for the 1st Armored Division uh, Sustainment Brigade. And then my brigade time, I was the Commandant of the NCO Academy up in J. Bear, Alaska. And, of course, right now I'm an Army University SAR major. So uh, education is important to me, and uh, it, as well as uh, the Civilian Corps, they're important to me as well. And for you, uh, after you came into the Army, at what point did you realize that this is something that I, number one, enjoy, and number two, this is something that I think I'm good at. I think I can be successful in this career. Right, so I think those, uh, those answers, uh, there's two different answers. When did I know? I'd say almost immediately. Uh, my first assignment was to the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, that brotherhood, uh, the camaraderie that I experienced when I first got there, uh, was nothing. It was something like I've never experienced before. So uh, I loved it right away. When did I find out I was good at it? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think I, I always did the best that I could, um, trying to you know follow at first, and then when I became a leader, lead, uh, teach people what I know, uh, not keeping secrets, uh, being genuine, uh, and and I don't think I paid much attention to whether I was good at it or not. Uh, but I enjoyed it immediately, and I think, uh, you know, as you progress in the military, I think it's those times where soldiers, after they're not serving with you anymore, and they reach out to you for advice or, or thanking you for what you've done for them in the past, that's when you start to realize you made an impact. So I don't know about being good, but that's when I know I've made an impact when people continue to reach out. So um, I think that's been just been throughout my career, but I still have the same passion and drive that I did when I was, you know, 18 years old that I have that I have now. And let's talk about uh, Army civilians because that's kind of the focus of our, our Leader Up podcast. And just for you, as the uh, Command Sergeant Major of Army University, which has a lot of Army civilians, talk about the importance that you see in leadership and leader development for Army civilians. Absolutely. So I will say that the uh, the Army civilians are – crucial to our mission. We could not accomplish our mission without our Army Civilian Corps. Um, and when I look at education, you know, you got the three domains, the institutional, operational, and self-development um, that applies to the, the soldiers. And we have, it, it's very structured for us. Um, and it, there's, coming here, I didn't know the similarities between the officer and enlisted. Um, they're very similar. Like we have the Common Corps developed down at uh, Fort Bliss for the enlisted folks. And then we developed that for the captain's career course here at Leavenworth. Um, and it's, and it's progressive and, and everything is well thought out. And, of course, there's curriculum changes to, to everything based off of the Army adapting. Um, so I was very well versed in education, especially enlisted PME. And the importance has always been there. There's, there. There had to be a significant reason why a soldier 
was deleted or deferred for going to their PME. Um, and almost no reason was good enough. If you were scheduled to go, you were going because that was tied to a promotion, tied to career success. Uh, um, so we always pushed for them to go. And I would say one of the things that I noticed, uh, I would say probably my previous assignment as the commandant of the NCO Academy in Alaska, um, all the emphasis I had on enlisted PME, of course, you're training soldiers, specialists to become sergeants. Um, and then our instructors, when they had to go to their ALC or SLC, whatever, for whatever MOS they were, uh, emphasis also placed on that. I'd, I was not aware of the same opportunities or just the system in place for the civilians uh, to get their education, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, and, and that's, looking back, uh, an improvement I could have made. Um, and how I address that is I kind of relied on my ranking civilian uh, there, and she managed everybody, made sure they were doing what they had to do. Um, and if something came before me, of course, I'd support it and sign it. Um, but I wasn't aware of all the opportunities that I could have afforded my teammates uh, if I'd have known and been more uh, well-versed in uh, all the opportunities that are out there for them. Uh, the, you know, for example, the intermediate course that is here, um, I didn't even push or encourage my GS-11 at the time to attend this course. Uh, having if I had the opportunity to go back, I would obviously fix that. I'd rectify that and I'd kind of uh, push her to go. And it's not about even tied to a promotion or wanting her to do well. It's just it's it's owed to her as much time and investment that she put into the organization, the passion, uh, along with the rest of my civilians, the passion and drive that they had and their commitment. Uh, every civilian that I've met that I know, they're as dedicated as the people that wear a uniform. Um, so I think we owe them the same opportunities that the rest of us have. And during your time as the Command Sergeant Major of Army University, you, you mentioned this a little bit, but what have you learned since you've been here about the role of Army civilians in the United States Army? Sure. So first of all, um, we're comprised uh, of many civilians in Army University, um, deputy directors, uh, instructors. They're, they're literally everywhere you go here. And when I said before, we wouldn't be able to function without them. We just don't have the manpower for everybody that wears a uniform. Not to mention, uh, I think the biggest thing that the civilians provide is that continuity. A lot of them are in the same position for a long time. They come, they become the experts. Uh, they're the ones that train the uniform people on whatever task or duties and responsibilities that they're getting into um, because they've been there and they know what, what's going on within an organization. Um, green suitors, we swap out every two to three years. So we go someplace and, you know, some of the things are similar, but a lot of the jobs we get into are completely different and we got to learn um, with, with the civilians there uh, they provide that continuity and tell us how things uh, should be done have been done in the past uh, and, and double-edged sword how things have always been done are sometimes good uh, and then change is also good um, but explaining the reason why they were done that way I think we, if, if the change is going to be made the civilians can say hey this is why it was done in the past um, and then the leaders with commanding in the signature block can say, well, this is the way we're going. And as long as there's open communication, mutual respect, I think it plays a huge role uh, in, in making an organization uh, successful and being able to grow and adapt. And I've, I've heard, uh, heard it said that uh, uh, simultaneously the greatest strength and the greatest weakness of the Army Civilian Corps is that we are able to stay in jobs for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Uh, so we we do have the continuity, but at the same time, sometimes we get uh, a little uh, stagnant in, in what we're doing. And uh, go ahead, you go ahead. I'll let you respond. No, to that. I, I, I've heard that before. Uh, I, I view it uh, as a strength, absolutely. I think uh, being there for the, as as long as they have, being invested in it, as long as as long as the passion is still there, as long as they still care about what they do, not not too many too many negatives come out of that, in my opinion. Don't get me wrong. I think uh, you're right. The stagnation, being there too long, set in their ways. Um, sometimes the relevancy from, uh, you know, if you're looking at an instructor, uh, for example, that used to wear a uniform, they've been away from a formation for an extended period of time. But typically what they're talking about um, still relates, still applies. And uh, our civilian population is extremely professional. They're not sitting back, you know, talking about their days uh, past and, and the, the way they did it. They're also reading uh going through different things to educate themselves. They keep up on army policies and stuff like that, just like the rest of us. Um, so 
if they're if they're value added, uh, they're absolutely relevant. It doesn't matter how long they've been there and the last time they wore a uniform. Um, and it, you know, it's like everything though. There there are some that just like uniform people that uh, aren't as value added as others. But for sure, I think uh, it's a huge strength having been in one position for so long. And I think that point that you made uh, a little bit uh, a few minutes back is is important. Is that I see things one way. I'm the continuity. I I get a a uniform person in who kind of wants to look at it differently. The communication is is the key to finding out the best way to move forward uh, and to engage with each other and talk about, you know, why, what is the intent. Uh, and the history helps understand that. But sometimes having somebody come in from the outside to kind of uh, shake things up a little bit is, is very helpful. For sure, I agree. So, uh, you know, officers are the only one with commanding in their signature block. So, I look at my civilian brothers and sisters as a, an extension of the NCO Corps. We don't have we don't have commanding in our signature block either. Uh, at my level, I'm an advisor, so I give the best advice I can. Um, and and you better believe that the advice that I give isn't all from my brain. I talk to the other subject matter experts. A lot of times those people, subject matter experts being civilians, I talk to them, get their input, talk to uh, other officers uh, that aren't in command, other NCOs. uh, And then when I advise, I give the best advice I can, the best military advice based off of uh, facts and and, and that I can provide. And ultimately a commander is going to make a decision and we're going to go that way. And if, as long as we've all communicated, usually transition uh, goes pretty smooth as long as everybody feels they've, uh, had an opportunity to speak up and say what they have to say. And then, you know, we, we move on as an organization uh, for the better. And most people will say that they, they don't necessarily want to get their way, but they want to be heard and understood. And I think that that can help that process. So let, let's go back to uh, 20, tw- you said 23 years ago is when you came in, right around 2000. 20, 26 years ago. I'm sorry, yep. 26 years ago. So 97. Okay, so the late 90s. Are you aware of or have you seen the role of the Ar- Army civilians change in those 26 years? I would say it's very similar to the way that uh, uniform has changed. Um, a, a lot more responsibility uh, used to be tied to any pay grade on the enlisted side of the house. I think we're asking more of our soldiers today than we were back when I was a soldier, uh, as a junior soldier. And I think our civilians are the same way, uh, regardless of their pay grade or whatever it is, a lot more is expected of them as well. I think, uh, a lot of it has to do with our environment. It's a very complex environment. Uh, a lot of things are changing. We have to be adaptable and, and just being able to do those things. Uh, and, you know, what drives that is war. Before I joined the Army, there, there was no war uh, when I joined. So we kind of did the same exercises, same rotations. At 82nd, I jumped in the same drop zone, dug the same foxhole, uh, you know, multiple times, rinse and repeat. And then, you know, when we went to war, we found out certain things we were doing weren't best practices or we needed to uh, add to or take away from uh, different things uh, to the way we train, the way we fight. And I'd say the civilians also uh, have to do that too. I mean, there's certain things that um, we did in the past and it was, you know, simplified. Now it's much more complex. So we're asking a lot more of everybody that supports the military, regardless if they're officer enlisted, warrant officer, or civilian. Everyone plays a, a significant role, and I think uh, everyone's role has amplified uh, compared to where it's been. And everyone's done a great job. And we see a lot more civilians in uh, leadership positions, um, uh, and that kind of started right after you came in in the in the early mid 2000s with uh, uh, the installation management agency, which is now installation management command, where principal staff people on a garrison staff went from being majors and lieutenant colonels to being uh, GS 12s and 13s. And so uh, I I agree with you that Army civilians are asked to do a lot more uh, in terms of, of, of leading, of exuding leadership. Um. What advice would you have for your peer command sergeants major out there or, uh, or even officers out there who are in charge of large formations of Army civilians in terms of their professional development? What would you tell them uh, now that, that you've learned in the past couple of years to, to, help, them, to help them help the civilians uh, more effectively? Absolutely. I would say, yeah. Uh, 
learn the systems more. Uh, do your own individual research. Uh, reach out and ask those senior civilians on installation uh, what they can do to help. Um, because if you don't, you're kind of doing a disservice to them. I mean, I, one of the things, uh, as we discussed, that continuity that's there with the civilian um, if, if a civilian employee feels like they're not valued, they might have been there for 10 years before you got there. The last thing you want to do is be the guy who forces them to up and leave because they feel undervalued or unappreciated um, because that, that hole is going to be much more significant. You can't just plug it with another soldier uh, because all that institutional knowledge is gone. Um, so make sure you know uh, your civilian employees know that they're valued. And one of the best ways you can do that is understand their systems. Um it, not education-wise, but even their performance evaluations, the way those are done. You don't go into the Army system and do them. They're done completely different. And if you don't know how to take care of them to show they're doing well uh, at the end of the year when they're, you know, recommended for a step increase or, uh, you know, monetary award or whatever those things are, um, if you don't take it seriously and show the same level of concern uh, about taking care of them as you do your soldiers, they're not going to feel valued or appreciated. So I'd say um, – Understand the system, reach out, and and if you don't know, uh, say you don't know and, and figure it out. There's A lot of them know, though. I'd say that, that as many civilians as we have uh, in the Army now supporting, a lot of them have been exposed to them uh, before they become a command sergeant major. But for those, uh, I was not one of those fortunate ones who had a lot of experience, so I figured it out after the fact. Um, and I wish I had spoke up more and said, hey, I'm not quite as familiar with this. I did learn, and I got to give a lot of credit to my exo uh back at Jay Bear in Alaska, uh, that brought me up to speed on it. Most of what I know is because of her. And then coming here, uh, even opened my eyes even more. And I know a lot of, uh, younger soldiers and, uh, even younger officers, their first e- experience with a army civilian is, um, that guy at CIF that wouldn't get, wouldn't take your canteen cover cause it had a thread hanging off of it. I don't know. Did you ever run into that? Oh, into- of, of course. I think, uh, and, and uh, I think you're right. I think uh, my first interaction with the civilian was at a CIF who kicked me back for, you know, I think it was the, the canteen, uh, the, not the cover, but the lid or something like that. So I think you you hit it exactly spot on. Um, keep in mind, they, they got a job to do. You know what I mean? So if they're not, if they're taking that as is and it's dirty and other soldiers getting it that way. Right. So even though they got a bad reputation for doing that, uh, I think they absolutely should do that because when I get issued something, I want to be able to use it immediately. Um, and, and they kind of uh, make sure they play honest broker with things that are turned in can be turned around, issued and used immediately. But uh, you know, we like to point the finger when a lot of the times the finger should be pointed back at yourself. Right. And uh, that's the continuity is to making sure the things are done correctly uh the mundane stuff that that helps the organization move forward um so let, let's kind of switch gears uh and talk a little bit about leadership um and and the first thing i want to ask you about is uh a topic that i i used to hear a lot about in the classroom that people were frustrated or uh, didn't understand and it's delegation and, so, and why is delegation important, and and what does good delegation look like? Right. So, so I think delegation uh, is a must in in almost everything we do on a day to day basis, uh, because if you don't delegate, you're trying to do everything and manage and supervise and lead everything all by yourself. And we've got phenomenal uh, subordinate leaders out there, and allowing them to make decisions, uh, accept prudent risk. Um, exercise discipline initiative and do all those things that you would expect a leader to do um, and allow them to make decisions. Also allow them to uh, possibly fail, make a, make a decision that's, you know, not in their best interest, an honest mistake, not one, you know, purposely hurting the organization. Uh, It makes them better. And the more repetitions we have with uh, delegating, allowing them to lead and make those decisions, they're going to get better. And then when they are in that position where they're the leader and they have the opportunity to delegate, they can share their lessons learned and, uh, you know, make the, uh, their organization better. And uh, I, I think you can't, you can't supervise everything. You can't be a micromanager. You have to allow your subordinate leaders to lead. And how does that uh, delegation, how does that build trust in an organization? Oh, I think uh, – I think it's everything. Uh, if I have a leader that uh, delegates uh, a specific duty to me, task, responsibility, spearheading a project, uh, champions, uh, you know, an initiative, 
um, that shows that they trust me uh, to be able to do that uh, at a professional level. And, and it, I take more pride in doing it. Uh, I want to do a good job because I'm representing them ultimately. And I think everybody wants to do well. And the, most people wake up in the morning wanting to do a good job. Nobody wakes up wanting to fail. So if someone delegates to you and they want, uh, they want you to do something and they trust you to do it, um, that trust that you have, it, it, it grows for that leader. And if you do a good job, hopefully that leader, uh, it, it grows in your subordinate leaders as well. So I think, uh, and, and if not, you know, there's a, how, how you respond if you don't perform well. It's a learning opportunity. You know, your leader can, you know, coach you up, tell you what you did right, wrong, and how to improve uh, during the AR session. Uh, and, and you can you can take that advice and say, yep, acknowledged and, you know, work on those things, get a second repetition at it, get better. And I think that that shows growth is what it is. So, yeah, it absolutely builds trust. And so delegation, um, I'm, what I'm kind of hearing is there's there's two – two components to it. The first one is uh, taking stuff off my plate so I can focus on uh, maybe bigger issues. But number two is developing that, uh, that subordinate so that they can, they can uh, move up or if I'm indisposed, they can uh, get a job done that, that I need done. And if I'm not there to, to get it taken care of myself. Absolutely. So I, I would say uh, the development piece to me is, is, is key. Um, it, it, you're right with both of the topics, but I, I, if you were only to have a shot at doing something when you are the leader, uh, you wouldn't be very good at it. So you have to have repetitions when you're a subordinate leader, you know, to someone else. You know, if you're a you know team leader, squad leader, and you fall under a platoon, uh, the platoon sergeant can't do everything. The platoon leader can't do everything. They got to delegate to their squad leaders and team leaders. Uh, company commander and first sergeant can't do everything. They got to delegate to their platoon sergeants and platoon leaders. Um, and, and the development piece is they're going to be in that job sooner or later. So give them a shot at it. Show them, let them see uh, how well they perform. Um, let them learn from uh, experiences and repetitions and make in decision making and leading uh, in scenarios that perhaps they're uncomfortable with. And, and I think when they're at the level that you're at, uh, they'll be better for it. And my next question is about um, skills for Army leaders. This is kind of a, a nebulous question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, if you had to lay down three important skills for Army leaders, so what, what, what would be the skills that an Army leader would need? And that would be officer, NCO, or civilian. What would, in, in uh, Command Sergeant Major Porras's world, the three most important skills that an army leader would need to have? I think the first one is uh, competence in whatever your uh, craft is. So if you're an infantryman, you got to be an expert infantryman. Um, if you're a medic, you got to be an expert medic. If you're a communications uh, soldier, you got to be an expert uh, with all the communications equipment. Um, and I think that goes without saying. You got to be good at what you're tasked to do. You got to understand how everything works. Uh, second thing is, I think you got to be a gen. You got to be genuine. Uh, soldiers uh, can identify whether you're being genuine or not. So, as a leader, if you're trying to be someone else or not yourself, uh, they can pick up on that pretty quick. So, being a genuine leader, being authentic. Um, so, genuine or authentic, however you want to put it, I think that is a that is a key one. Uh, and. and Along those same lines, genuinely care. Don't just tell people, hey, I care, and, and you, then you don't answer your phone on the weekend because, you know, at, at 1700 on Friday, you shut your phone off. Um, when, when soldiers need you, they want to be able to reach you. So being authentic and genuine uh, definitely matters. And then uh, last one I'd say is the, the ability to uh, listen. Um we're pretty good at barking orders. We're pretty good at uh, giving direction. Uh, we're, we're not always very good at listening. And some of the best ideas I've ever heard in the military came from someone junior to me. Um, and things have worked out great because I listened and I said, you know, what? that's a great idea. Let's give it a shot. And sometimes, you know, it was a more efficient way to do something or we got stuff done. So I'd say those are my, my three uh, off the top of my head. I might be able to come up with better ones if, uh, if I was more prepared, but I think those are those are three uh, good attributes or qualities. And so, leader up audience out there, those will, I'm I'm just going to recap those. Uh, number one, competence. Number two, authenticity, and then number three is is listening skills. Those were the skills that uh, Sergeant Major Porras listed out for us. And um, I, I want to talk. Uh, 
a little bit about this article that you wrote for the NCO Journal uh, back in September of 2022. And uh, these are, and I, let, let me, I, I'm going to let you talk about why you wrote it and kind of the background of this, uh, if, if you can do that. And then I'm going to ask you about some of these specific points. Sure. So the NCO Journal reached out. Uh, they're doing a call for articles to to everybody. I wasn't the only person who wrote an article. There's some there's some really good ones out there. Um, they asked me if I'd be interested in putting together a top ten list or of, of things that I wish I could tell my younger self. Things looking back on my career that I wish I'd known then that I know now. Um, and so I you know came up with my top ten, um, put it together. Uh, sent it to him for editing, and next thing you know, it's published. So it was, uh, it, it was, it was pretty good. So uh, uh, I enjoyed being able to put some thought into it, and, and I did. Um, some of them were, uh, uh, I'd say, a little bit humorous, but definitely, uh, definitely important and serious at the same time. You know, I, I might may have wrote the uh, uh, the line in there as being humorous, but it's definitely important and significant to me. And we have uh, we we put a link. Uh, to this article for uh, our Leader Up audience uh, in the show notes for this podcast. So if you're interested in reading the entire thing, we have a link to it uh, out there, Leader Up audience. But I wanted to ask about um, just a couple of these and get you to elaborate on them. And uh, the first one is you're not special. Uh, You're just old and you've been around a long time. And uh, just what, what, what do you mean by that, and what 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 is kind of the example that you used in that to illustrate that point? Sure. So I think a lot of uh, a, a lot of people let rank go to their. I wouldn't say a lot. Certain individuals let rank go to their head, and they start feeling special when they reach certain positions. Uh, and, and usually, it reflects in poor decision making. They think they're untouchable. Um, they think that uh, where they're at, um, they're, they're the you know they're they're held to a higher. Uh, higher, not a higher standard, but a higher regard that there's a status associated with it. Uh, and I, what I remind myself is the difference between me and a staff sergeant is I've been in for 26 years. If they're in for 26 years too, they're probably going to be a sergeant major as well. Um, so it's, it's not that I'm special. Um, someone's going to replace me when I'm done here. Um, I've just been in for a long time and everyone gets those opportunities at those positions if they progress. So you can't let, let your rank position or status uh, define who you are. Who I was when I joined the Army is still who I am now. Uh, the values that I hold uh, in, that are important to me still apply. The Army values still apply to me. Um, I can't let uh, where I'm at now, or if I'd have known then as I continued to progress, I think it would get a lot of soldiers out of trouble. If they keep remembering that they're not special, people have done that before them, people are going to do that after them. Uh, that It's just that you've been around for the Army and You've earned it for sure, but at the same time, uh, other people have earned it too. So it, the rules absolutely still apply to you. And the example you gave in that was uh, sandbags. So just tell me about uh, how how sandbags is related to that one. Yeah, so I, I, I would say my, uh, my my last deployment as a battalion sergeant major, uh, you know, we were filling sandbags. And a lot of the times it was the work details, our force protection guys. It was a bunch of... Uh, uh, junior soldiers filling them. And I said, nope, that's not how it's going to be. Um, so I went out there as the battalion CSM. I started filling sandbags. And then I talked to, uh, it was one, uh, even in theater, we still have to do command of staff and stuff like that. So we uh, we were in there and I talked to all my command teams, the company command teams. And I said, hey, from this time to this time, force protection is off the hook. They're not filling any sandbags. We are going to go out there and do it. And it all looked to me like I was crazy at first, but I had company commanders and first sergeants out there Alongside of me, we fill sandbags to, to let them know, hey, look, still a requirement. The sandbags protect everybody. Um, so we're all going to do our fair share and we're going to fill them in. And we did. And it actually ended up being a pretty good time. Maybe competition to see who could fill the most. And uh, uh, they appreciated it. And then when they saw other people filling sandbags, you know, other people would join in. And it kind of trickled down. I would say there was other, a lot more participants doing it after that just because they saw, uh, you know, other leaders out there doing it. And the other one that I'd like to talk to you about is, um, and I'll, I'll read this one. If you get that gut feeling that someone wants to talk about something and they don't engage you, go and engage them. So just tell me about that one and maybe some uh, experiences you've had uh, with that. Right. So I think uh, I think most leaders that have been in the military uh, have pretty good instincts. And I think that's because uh, 
the way leadership is is taught to us. Uh, as a sergeant E five, you're, you're checking to make sure your soldiers shave. You're checking to see what, give them safety briefs on the weekend, asking what their plans are. So you get to know your soldiers pretty pretty intimately, uh, especially as a first line leader. Um, and then the more senior you get, uh, the less direct uh, leadership you have over soldiers. But you'll know. Uh, you'll know from those times when you were that direct line leader when something's off about somebody. Um, and, and it can be, you know, suicidal ideations or, you know, any of those things where someone just doesn't look right. Um, and a lot of times uh, they're not going to come out and say something. Now, if you ask or you uh, ask questions how they're doing, they might slowly go down and ask things. How, and it doesn't have to be suicide. It can just be, you know, something bad happened in your life. And just stopping and take a moment to let them know that you care and you listen to them. Sometimes they just want to be heard. Let them know what's going on. Uh, you know, what they're missing when you're when you're coming out on a Saturday to fill sandbags, going back to the last question or whatever it is. Um, and then relating and being sympathetic to what's going on. It doesn't mean you have, you know, you're, they're not excused from duty or anything like that, but finding out why and talking to them and then letting them know they're important. I think uh, I think uh, that was kind of the point on that one. And that's listening. You You talked about the three skills earlier, and the third one was listening. And part of listening is observing and noticing people and kind of like you're saying when you notice changes in behavior and you don't hear anything from that person go and engage with them and it's hard some people are easy to read for example uh, i think i would be easy to read if i ever showed up to work one day it was quiet didn't say anything sat in my office and uh you know, didn't come out. I think uh, people would know something's wrong, right? They'd be like, you okay? Um, but other people are kind of introverted, and those are the harder ones to read. Uh, so I think you got to spend a little bit extra time to, to talk to them and find out what's going on uh, and, and see if, if that's just their personality, that that may be. And, and a lot of times nothing nothing's there. And uh, a, a good TTP that I used, um, and this goes back to uh, my entire time as a, as a first sergeant and, and as sergeant major, for one of the first things I do is I team up with the chaplain. And, and when I was deployed, we did battlefield circulation. I took my chaplain with me. And as we went through, we talked to people, and I gave the chaplain an opportunity to talk as well. And I'd say, hey, if anybody has anything for me, the chaplain, you know, we'll stand by after we're done talking. And you know, we just mingle and talk to the, talk to the soldiers. Uh, and some of them wanted to talk to the chaplain specifically. Some of them, you know, looked at him as a, purely a religious figure, and they weren't religious. They didn't want to talk to him. They talked to me. Uh, oftentimes, they didn't say anything to either one of us. But then when we got back, we'd have an email from them or, hey, this soldier uh, would like to talk to you, you know, after we left. They didn't want to say anything in front of their peers. So um, I think just affording multiple people they can talk to, uh, that worked for me. So one of the first things I did is I buddied up with the chaplain and, you know, forced him to go places I went. And if I found out he was going somewhere, usually I tagged along just to make sure there was two of us so that uh, uh, two, two different people willing to listen. And sometimes when, when you engage with someone like that, there are, there are sometimes when it's something where you can take action and uh, provide some kind of uh, response. But there's other times when it's not really uh, – there, there's nothing that can be done to satisfy the problem. But the person it, – it's helpful just to have someone else – to go to, to talk to and share that, share their feelings. Do, is that, do you agree with that? Is that? I do. And I, I would say sometimes, uh, a lot of it is goes back to communication. Uh, soldiers don't understand why they're doing something, uh, and they'll explain it to you and you'll be like, Oh, well, the reason you're doing this is, you know, X. And they'll be like, I had no idea. That's why I was doing it. And then a simple conversation like that, their whole outlook on what they, what they're doing completely changes or, Hey, yes, this is something that's uh, not fun. We all have to do it. We've all done it. Or unfortunately, you guys are the ones doing it, but it'll rotate. Someone else will get it. Um, just the, the understanding, the communication. A lot of people, once they have someone talk to them and, and you know, listen and that, or explain to them, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times their outlook will change. But, you know, we're in the Army. There's some stuff that we do is just not fun. Um, uh, I've done my fair share of things that aren't fun uh, and, and when it's explained to me or, or you know, whatever it is. Or sometimes I just vent, you know, sometimes I, I say something and get it off my chest and then I, I continue to do the thing that's not fun. But uh, by and large, I think uh, that ups and downs, uh, I've had a great time and it, it is important to reach out and talk to them though. And the, the, the last uh, one of these 10 that I wanted to get your thoughts about is number eight. Uh, people make mistakes 
and uh, most people don't make as many as you do. And just t- tell me a little bit about the, the importance of allowing mistakes, learning from mistakes, tolerating, uh, I'll say tolerating less than perfection. Why is that important uh, for leaders to keep, keep that in, uh, in their minds? Yeah, I would say every leader in the United States Army has made a mistake somewhere along the lines in their career. I don't think there's any perfect leader. Um, everybody's done something that's been a little bit bonehead. Uh, and the reason it's important, it's growth opportunity. Uh, when you make that mistake, it all boils down to how you react to it. It's not it's not what you did. Uh, it's how you react and how you respond. Teams get better by, uh, by failing oftentimes. When you fail at something, uh, it's not a good feeling. Nobody that I know likes to fail. Nobody that I know likes to make a mistake. Um, so when you do make a mistake, you want to get better. I think that's, that's human nature. You want to do better at it. So allowing someone to make a mistake, uh, assuming no one, you know, no loss of life, limb, eyesight, anything like that, allowing them to fail and then teaching them what right looks like and showing them, uh, and allowing them a second chance at it to get better. That's how teams grow. So it's growth opportunity. And that, and that, that kind of coaching process, uh, of, of, younger soldiers or younger officers or army civilians is is important where it's not just that you made a mistake and you get called out uh, for it but it's like you said what does right look like why did you make that choice and uh, what can you do about it in the future that's that's how how people are developed and how they grow not not just the you made a mistake, I'm going to highlight it and and publicly embarrass you for it. For sure. And I'd say that, uh, you know, without allowing mistakes to be made and, uh, I guess, uh, allowing people to recover, and it could be even a personal life mistake. You know, they can make a poor decision in their personal life and they get in trouble for it. Um, but without that, uh, that would mean that someone goes, you know, 15 years in their career without anything negative happening. And then when that one negative thing happens, it's catastrophic. Um, so I think people, uh, uh, you know, failing at smaller things that aren't catastrophic uh, allows them to be able to adapt, overcome them, and, and get better. So I think uh, certainly we don't strive for failing. That's not what I'm saying. We certainly strive to to win and, and do good. Um, but allowing people to become more resilient through through hardships, I think it's important. And the, the last thing that I wanted to, to talk to you about is an uh, experience that happened to me when I was uh, on active duty in the Army. I was a company commander uh, and this was in 1989, and um, first sergeant walked into my office, uh, one, and this first sergeant was a Vietnam veteran, as a lot of my NCOs were back then, and he said, uh, soldier so-and-so was found asleep during CQ last night, okay? Uh, we're, we need to give him a company grade Article 15, okay? And um, one of the punishments that he recommended to me was, he, th- and this was an E3, he said, you need to take a stripe from him also. And I thought that was a little harsh, um, but he said, he said he's a good soldier, he'll make it back, and it might be the best thing for him. And it's taken me since 1989 thinking about that uh, to, to understand the, the, the logic and the philosophy behind that. And I'm just curious, um, what's your response to that? Is that can, help me understand – the kind of the role in in discipline uh, matched up with uh, making mistakes. Why is that important? And in that case, why why would that have been the best thing for that soldier? Sure. So I, I would say a couple things. First, uh, you know, when people make mistakes, and you know, you being the company commander. Uh, it's kind of important to give similar punishments for similar crimes, and, and I don't know what the punishments were before you had to make that decision, but it might be this is the standard within the organization. If anyone else does it, this is what's going to happen to everybody. So it makes the organization better. Uh, Unfortunately, one person had to make the first mistake. Um, But when it comes to making him better, um, you're taking something that belongs to him. He he was an E3. He was a private first class because he earned it. It was his stripe. When you take it from him, if you, it, it could be anything, whatever belongs to you. If someone takes it from you, you want it back. So you're going to work harder to get it back. If you take something from me that belongs to me, I'm not just going to let you take it. I'm going to I'm going to get it back one way or another. Uh, how do we do that in the army? We earn it. So the way he got his uh, stripe back and became a PFC a second time was he had to earn it. He had to get it back. Um, and good soldiers will respond that way. 
Now, most of us recognize when we make a mistake, uh, he, he, he knew he fell asleep, so he's not going to do that again, and he's going to prove himself time and time again to earn it back. So ultimately, I think uh, when soldiers are punished, they respond one of two ways. They respond uh, positively to it, even if it's a you know, bad situation for them, and they're going to take back what was uh, taken from them and they're gonna, through, through earning it. Uh, or they're going to go to a downward spiral, but that's where leadership comes in. That's where talking to them, hey, this is what you got to do. Um, even if they don't want to, hey, we've invested, you know, it could be we invested too much into you. We, we, we see potential in you. We're not going to let this keep you down. We're going to make you earn it back because we see something in you. We see potential in you. And just sharing those things, I think, are important. And people, correct me if I'm wrong, but people want to be held to a high standard. And they want to know if they've met that standard. And if they haven't, it, it's, it's helpful sometimes for people to see the consequences of, of not meeting a standard. Sure. I think uh, if you ask us we, who joined the Army because we thought it would be easy, I don't think any hands would be raised. Uh, we joined the Army because we thought it would be hard. We're, t- we're tasked to do some difficult things. Uh, we signed up. We volunteered to do things that most people won't volunteer to do. We want to be held to a higher standard. Uh, we are proud of our service. We're proud of the uniform we put on. Uh, we're proud of it all. So, yeah, being held to a high standard, we all want that. We, we, we strive for that. Um, plus, a good story is it, it, it's not I went to work, nothing significant happened. I went home for the day. It was easy. That's not a, that's not a fun story to sit around the campfire and tell your grandkids. You want to say – I went through X, Y, and Z. It was extremely difficult. Bad things happened. It was hard. I don't know how I, how I survived, but I did. You don't want to be able to tell those stories. So being held to a high standard so that you can reflect back on those hard times, showing that you were able to o- overcome and, and be successful, I think that's important. Not, hey, it was real easy, did 20 years, nothing significant happened, uh, and that's it. You know, no, no one joined for that. We all joined because we're proud of, uh, uh, of the organization, proud of the United States Army and proud of the organizations that we've been parts of. Uh, and so, Command Sergeant Major Jason Porras, I really want to thank you for your time. Your time is very valuable uh, as the Army University Command Sergeant Major, and I, I really want to thank you for stopping by and talking to us today on Leader Up. So thank you for that very much. No, I really appreciate you guys having me. It was an honor to be on. Uh, thank you guys very much. And so, Leader Up audience, what did you hear today that uh, that you're interested in? Click on that, that link to the article that uh, – Command Sergeant Major Porras wrote and, and read through those uh, items that, that we just talked about. And um, as he said, I- engage with your military counterparts and help them understand uh, the importance of civilian education and the civilian education system, how people uh, get enrolled for their CES classes, and um, make sure that your military counterparts Uh, are involved and understand that system and thank you for listening and join us again next time for another edition of leader up as always if you have any questions or feedback or would like to learn more about our podcast please check the description for our email and for our website thanks for listening